Well, good morning, everyone. It's Ian Hull here. Uh, we're just setting up. What I just ask everyone, if we could, we're trying a Zoom one this week. The Facebook one was a technological disaster at the end. So we're hoping this will go well. Could I ask everybody to take the audio off and mute and, uh, at this point because it helps the stream. Apparently, um, it just takes a little of the uh, internet oh. to draw off this. So if you hit mute and you hit uh, your audio off on the screen, uh, I'm on an iPad, but it's the, when it drops down to put stop video, you, you can still, I think, see uh, Jordan and I, but um, you're, you're not using bandwidth to project yourselves and, and hit mute as well. Then we can um, uh, uh, do this. Now, uh, my co-host, uh, uh, Jordan Aiton, you going to stay on there. There you are. Good. Hi, Jordy. How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? Good morning. Uh, great. Morning, everybody. Good morning. So um, I'm just going to uh, start off. Uh, we've got a whole pile of questions, and we've got a chat. Um, I'm just going to call up my chat line here just to make sure. And um, so please send in chat requests as well. We'll monitor them as best we can. But people have sent in some questions. I just thought we would start with what it appears to be a bit of a pressing issue. And um, we'd hope to hear more today, but we haven't yet on the whole question of video uh, wills and can someone um, does in the presence of include video. Uh, at, at this point, uh, we've been working, a, a group of us have been working with the Attorney General to actually have the law amended. And Jordy, maybe you can give us an update on that and also just your thoughts on what is the current um, uh, status. Now, is there problems with sound? I'm just hearing a chat from the sound. It's, I, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, so hopefully uh, we'll keep going. All right. So um, unless uh, people start sending us wild messages about sound problems, we'll keep going. So Jordy, why don't we start with the, the video wills? Right. So um, uh, we are hoping to have some legislation. Uh, a group of us were involved in that, uh, talking to the uh, AG. We are hopeful, um, but we don't know the specifics, we don't know the timing, um, and we don't know uh, to, to what uh, wills it's going to be applicable. Um, and so uh, I personally am hesitant. I would not be doing video witnessing right now. Uh, I think it requires a court to, um, to do something on their own that they've been unwilling to do historically. Uh, which is extend uh, the idea of, um, uh, of in the presence of and the formalities, strict compliance for witnessing wills. Uh, they haven't been willing to extend that at, uh, at all because we don't have substantial compliance legislation. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I would not be um, doing that personally. Uh, I think there are other alternatives that uh, are not perfect but are uh, lower risk. Um, uh, and uh, I think we've talked about them before, and I'm happy to discuss that again. But um, just my and just my personal view um, that I wouldn't be uh, running out and trying to do video because uh, if they do bring in legislation, I suspect it's going to be quite specific, um, and it uh, you may not have complied or you may not comply with it if you just do it sort of ad hoc. All right, so let's just briefly recap the options. It, and because we all are facing with some urgent uh, wills and uh, it may, maybe we're days away, I'm hoping days away from the solution. But in the interim, uh, of course, they are, they, they, they're drawn through uh, two steps that we've uh, identified that are the safest, and that is the holograph will or send it out to be executed in front of witnesses. Uh, and Jordy, maybe just do a quick recap on both those two options. And, and I understand you've got a, a resource for that. Right. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, what I would say on that, uh, so obviously the holograph will uh, idea, so advising clients to uh, do up their own holograph will is one option. If it's a simple situation, it doesn't work as well, obviously, if you've got a more complicated situation. So one option um, that we've highlighted in our blog, um, and I'll, I think I'll share my screen here, if I can do that. Um, and uh, hopefully people can see my screen. Um, we did an article about using a holograph will to validate an unsigned will. So using the principle of 
incorporation by reference. Um, so basically, you, you send the client a uh, 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 your formal will um, that's all typed up. They get it. Uh, they print it out. They uh, they acknowledge that that's the one they want. I Ian and I recommend that we that you sign it and that you admit that you have it. sorry the client signs it and they initial it etc. So they can identify it. And then they do a simple holograph will uh, that uh, in, it incorporates the terms of the formal will into it. And so it says um, so simply, well, it, it, with a few minor things, it says I'm incorporating this document as Schedule A into this uh, will, and I intend it to be part of this will. Um, this blog uh, highlights a couple of cases that support that position. Uh, there is an Ontario case called Facey and Smith that, um, and it's highlighted in our um, in our blog here, um, that says you can't do it. The facts of that case was, was a murder suicide case, and it was all in Obiter. He had decided uh, not to find that it was valid, but then went on to say, and even if it was valid, you know, it was a testamentary document, it wasn't validly executed. Um, so <clears throat> just um, be noted that, so we don't have a guarantee of this, of course. Um, we have a, a link uh, to um, sort of the instruction sheet um, that can be followed um, by a client. Uh, if they're going to use this process, we've uh, come up with sort of a, a set of instructions um, and uh, what should be in the holograph wheel. Um, and so if you'd like to download that, if you go to our blog, um, and uh, we can find the details on that. Um, and uh, you can download this and use it as you see fit um, if you're going to use that approach. So, Jordy, the second approach, which we've also got some precedent materials on, is sending the will out to be signed. Sure. So let's, uh, let's pull that one up. Let me just uh, stop sharing for a second while I pull that up. And, sure. Um, I'll, yeah. Maybe, Ian, if you can just... Uh, Repeat what your father said about that when we when we were in calmer times about sending wills out for execution. <laughs> I actually refer, I forget one of the rare cases. What did he, what did he say? He so said, "Don't good. don't do it." <laughs> that was, it's going to be just a short sort of answer there, Ian. You're not you're not playing along. the The idea was, uh, you know, of course, historically we didn't like the idea of sending out a will to be signed by um, uh, by a client on their own. And so um, uh, Rodney Hull, uh, Ian's dad, as we all know, um, wrote a, uh, an article about don't send the will out uh, for execution. The risk, of course, is that it's not executed properly. And then you're, um, so I'm just searching for this as we talk about it. Um, uh, here we go. Okay. Um, and the risk is, of course, that it's not executed properly. So, uh, and then you're on the hook, potentially. So. Um, if that's going to be the case, if you're going to send it out, and that only works, of course, if, if the uh, client has two independent witnesses who can witness the uh, execution of that document. So right now, when everyone's in isolation, um, it's unlikely that that's going to be a possibility. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, I had one done last week where they had a caregiver there, et cetera, um, and another a neighbor. Um, but one of the one of the risks, of course, as I've said, is the is the fact that it's not executed. Then somebody comes back to you and says, "Well, you didn't have this executed properly. It's worthless, and you're you're liable." So we recommend, if you're going to use this strategy, that you limit the retainer. Um, and I'll just highlight that. So we've um, produced some uh, a little draft here. So I'm just going to, uh, for an amendment to your retainer. So if you've been retaining. And now you want to say, well, I'm not retained to see to the execution of the will. Um, this is a document that we have there. And it's, again, a link in our, um, on our blog. And then there's this, uh, I've used this, uh, let me just see if I can reduce the size so you can see the whole page. So um, this is a will execution checklist that I've sent to the client. And, and it's also available on the blog. And it takes the client through all of the steps because, of course, we have to be so particular about that um, and request that they initial it as they go. So you sign here, then you sign here, then you sign here. Um, 
and and that's what we've done with this checklist. And uh, um, so please feel free to uh, to use that uh, uh, or modify it or do whatever you like with it. But um, uh, it's a good uh, help, I think, uh, for for that kind of strategy. That's great. Thank you. All right, let's turn to, we've got a, several questions now, uh, Jordy, on uh, probate applications. And uh, I, I, there was, someone's asked about uh, new markets, the experience in new market. Every jurisdiction's got their own tweaks and uh, twists and turns. Toronto's, for example, uh, because one of the big concerns, of course, is, is that you're, you've got the original will and you've got, sometimes you've got uh, bank orders uh, uh, to, um, in terms of paying the probate fees and not checks. So with the original wills concern, uh, certainly in Toronto, what they have uh, resolved it with is that between 10 and 12 and 2 and 4 p.m., you can actually drop off uh, probate applications. Um, they are uh, on the eighth floor. You can drop, the couriers can drop them off on the eighth floor and uh, alleviates uh, a lot of the problems in terms of getting it there. You can, of course, mail it, but mailing it brings with it its own uh, risks because uh, you're sending the original will. If you have to mail it, uh, one of the, the tools that we've used is uh, just uh, we, we make sure we set it, uh, in our reporting letter to the client, say, look, there's a risk it's going to be lost. And if it's lost, then we have to do a lost will application. It's not that we can't probably still prove the will because the presumption is it was the last in the hands of the lawyer, not the, the, the deceased. So the will is uh, going to be proven, but those are extra steps and there's risk if you put it in the mail. Um, I know in Hamilton, uh, we just got a probate uh, in three weeks. So it sounds like probates are being moved along at a different pace in different jurisdictions. Uh, but um, I just uh, sort of uh, wanted to raise the, the Toronto experience. And uh, if people outside of the jurisdiction are uh, running into the same problems, making sure they can get the original will safely there, Toronto's uh, resolved it in that way. And you can also drop off in Toronto. Um, so before we go on to the next one, just remind everyone we'll keep our video feeds off and are uh, on mute because we're having a little bit of glitching with the Zoom uh, only because of the fact that at this hour it starts to get um, incredibly busy uh, internationally, so to speak. All right, Jordy, did you have any other uh, sort of comments on um, probate applications? Uh, well, obviously, we're still doing them, and uh, the di difficulty is the commissioning of, of affidavits um, of, uh, uh, you know, for the application, and, of course, the will is an exhibit to that. Um, now, uh, and I don't know, Ian, if you want to just address the Law Society's uh, position on commissioning by video, um, but that's how we're having to deal with those kinds of things. Um, so... Um, yeah. yeah, sure. Why don't you just make a comment on that, and then we'll move on to some capacity questions we're getting. Uh, right. So the so the law society, and I'm going to try to pull it up, but the law society has um, uh, has allowed. Uh, they're they're obviously the it's the act that applies uh, the commissioner for taking affidavit back. Um, but the law society had said, from a professional point of view, um, they understand the difficulties of being in person, and while that's uh, you know, would be great. Uh, they recognize that you don't, you won't, might not be able to do that, and so they're not going to, I guess, take you to task for um, for not um, uh, being in the presence of uh, of the deponent when you commission the affidavit. That's great. Okay, so, so this one um, is Ian, just, yeah, go ahead. Just, um, just, uh, some people have indicated. I, I don't know if my video is on. If anybody can let me know if they can see my video, I thought it's, is it yeah. showing you? Yeah. Okay. It's showing. Not that anybody wants to see it, but somebody just said that. So. No, it's, it's easier if we see you when you're talking. Um, okay. All right. So uh, I just want to go to uh, now, one of the things that uh, we've uh, encouraged in our practice, and I know you're doing it is using video though, for everything up to the execution. And, um, uh, the question no, of testing can't see me. Can't, what some people can't see me, but that's okay no problem yeah that's fine um, uh, the uh, the question of uh, it, we've we've determined that we're not going to have the will signed until the legislation gets changed by a video but the video uh, tool is a, an effective tool on every other step in the uh, 
process. And uh, Jordy, I want to talk a little bit and have you just give some thoughts on what are you doing in terms of a step-by-step uh, intake through to um, execution uh, in this uh, COVID uh, world? Well, I've, I used remote uh, meeting uh, um, and Zoom before this whole thing. Uh, so fortunately, I had, been a, I had a little experience with it. Um, but so Zoom is, uh, I use it at every meeting now, for sure, obviously. Um, if any of you are trying to take instructions uh, by phone only, you'll, you can appreciate how difficult that is. Um, a, you can't see the client, they can't see you. It's a very disconnected process. Zoom um, or any of the other uh, software allows you to uh, A, have video uh, interaction with them so you can see them. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about the usefulness of that. Um, but the other thing is, uh, even if you can uh, use your screen, the other thing is you can share your screen. So um, let's say you don't have any software at all, um, uh, but you can you can show them, for example, I can pull up my Word document, a blank Word document, um, and, you know, just show them um, and type as we go and, and they can, you know, I don't know, you can put your notes up here, uh, all to spouse, et cetera. You can sort of do that. So there's an interactive, they can see it um, if you want to use a sort of a low tech way of doing it. Um, I think it's still so helpful as I've always believed that um, showing the client what's going on so that they're seeing what you're writing down uh, and what you're hearing uh, and, and making sure that you're hearing what they're saying is, is crucial. So you can even use it in this kind of low tech. Um, uh, there's whiteboard um, software uh, that you could use so the client can see that, that you're getting what they're talking about and say, no, 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 when I, you know, when you say absolute uh, and they can give it to the new wife, uh, oh, no, I, I don't want that. Um, you know, so when, when they actually see, that, see it, um, it's, it's very powerful. The other thing that Zoom allows you to do, and which I've done historically, is record the whole meeting. So with the consent of the client, you click on your record button. But not only is the video and the audio uh, recorded, but so is the screen share. So um, they can, so you have a record of uh, what went on, what, you, what notes you took if you're sharing that with the client. And the great thing is when, when, if you forget what the conversation was when you talked about the absolute gift to the spouse, you can watch it on video and only and just move it along and say, okay, when I started to type all of the spice, what was I talking about? And just play that part of it. So that's what, um, you know, I, I love the, the use of Zoom. I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to be the way we're going to use it uh, or, or deal with this uh, very often, even past this whole crisis. Um, and so that's what, um, uh, that's the way to use, I think, uh, a remote software um, or at least remote video software. Um, and I don't know if you wanted me to talk anything else. Yeah, so, all right. And, and um, from that standpoint then, do uh, you have a tool that you're using that, that you, you specifically are uh, uh, streamlining right. the process with? Right, so, um, and many of you have heard of it. Uh, Ian and I created some software for planning and drafting wills. Um, and uh, we have a bunch of users, I think, on, on, uh, on the call right now. Um, the idea is that rather than just writing out things on your screen, it creates, um, it does the planning for you. So um, you can uh, uh, gather the data from the client directly through an online questionnaire, and then it creates a family tree, and it asks you to make sure that you've covered a bunch of issues, and then um, can show and again, if you're using this with Zoom, the client is watching as you do this, dragging assets, creating gifts, um, and then creates summary pages for the client right on the screen. So they can see, oh, my will is going to do this. I'll just sort of to zoom this in a little bit. So you can, the client, if you're my client, for example, uh, when we finish the plan, and it's a live plan. So as we're going through it, we're, we're showing the client what we're doing and they get a summary of what's going on. Um, so this is 
Uh, it was extremely powerful and in person when you had a monitor on your desk and the client could watch. Um, uh, and it's even more powerful when you're using it remotely. And it's the only way really to uh, ensure that the client and you are on the same page. We've, you know, people have been raising, I, um, I was on a call or a webinar for the OBA and we had a whole bunch of people, 350 people or something. And, you know, there was the topic of undue influence, how concerned we should be about undue influence. I'm much, I mean, undue influence is one case in a hundred. Uh, what's much more problematic is the will that you got instructions for on the phone um, that you never really shared with the client uh, in a communicative way or saw it with them and they didn't understand. It. And that's the argument that you've got to fight if you took all the instructions by phone, then sent them the draft. Um, and it's, it's a difficult uh, problem, much more difficult when you don't have an in-person meeting. And I think um, that's a much higher likelihood of a claim than, uh, or, or a challenge to the will than undue influence. If somebody, even though you couldn't see them in the room, is behind them with a knife to their back and they're saying, yes, 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 and you don't notice. Uh, personally, I don't see that as a huge risk um, uh, it's, it's, well, not, not compared to the risk that the client gave you under instructions that they didn't really understand the implications of. So, and they can, so, I'm sure Ian, you'd be happy to help anybody if anybody has questions about that software or whatever you, I'm sure you can. Yeah, no, um, and that's great. And, and that's a helpful tool for, for the intake. And then also, as you say, you can do it old school and just grab a, a word document and, uh, share sc screen share. Uh, so the client at least sees uh, visually what's going on. Uh, yeah. In terms of the questions and the intake uh, issue regarding undue influence and test metric capacity, that of course is a big issue from the standpoint of uh, determining test metric capacity. The undue influence piece, I just emailed you, Jordy, and maybe you could screen share when you find it. Uh, Kim Whaley just put out a log, I think today or yesterday, on some of the considerations you will want to uh, uh, look at when you are addressing the issue of undue influence with video um, intake. And uh, she's uh, anticipating the change in the law uh, in, in her blog, but it's uh, a really helpful tool because it gives some uh, good checklist uh, steps to um, have uh, ready. And, um, and even if you are using that as an internal document, you can use it uh, and save it into the file saying, look, these are some of the inquiries I made through the checklist. Uh, and uh, Kim's made one and we have one too, but Kim's put one out as of uh, today and I thought it was an excellent uh, product. So uh, the other question really is uh, the question of testamentary capacity. And I don't think, Jordy, what you think, it may be different, but um, I don't, I'm not sure it changes any uh, at all in the context of uh, video, except that you wanna make sure that of course you've got a secure and careful uh, uh, link and that you take probably you take a little bit more time, uh, especially in circumstances with video. Uh, I don't think it changes the nature of the uh, inquiry, uh, the effort. And as you said earlier, it allows for recording. So uh, that can be good and bad, but it's the reality that you're probably going to record if you're going to do a Zoom call. So um, it makes uh, it, it puts a little bit more onus on the lawyer not to uh, ask leading questions. And uh, you're going to be tested right. on that. Uh, right. You're going to be seen as as uh, having late, you know, give provided leading questions, <laughs> uh, and you're going to be scrutinized at a level that is not what you normally would be scrutinized if you only took notes, because your notes may not reflect the nature of the question as precisely as the video will. So open-ended questions, back to sort of law school 101, open-ended questions, and um, direct the, uh, the the testator to. Um, questions that uh, can be repeated as well. I, I, I like to circle back um, uh, uh, on the questions. And so I'll open a, with a question and then throughout the questioning and the, and the intake I'm doing, I'll come back to a similar question to just to test and short-term memory issues and things like that. Those tools are all tools that we use, but um, remember you're gonna be under careful scrutiny and this will be a, a piece of evidence that will land in the job. So. Um, Okay, here's uh, Jordy, go ahead. I hope that's coming up. That, this is Kim Whaley's blog, right? Um, yep. And I'm just, I'm just trying, there it is. Uh, and 
so there's a checklist built right into it. Uh, questions to ask. Um, you know, uh, I'm listening. To, that's is really excellent. Uh, a lot of these tips are uh, relevant uh, uh, post COVID uh, for capacity. Um, you know, the number one question, if capacity is in, in is an issue, is why. I think that's really the great question. Uh, if you get instructions um, to uh, change the will in some way or an unusual disposition, um, you know, I that's the question I and I usually just stop with why. Um, and so why are you preferring one kid to another? Just just the why, and just uh, see what comes out. Um, and then, of course, the idea that to drill down on the why. Uh, and, and I often, as Ian said, come back to that why. Um, it's very helpful. I, again, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to overemphasize this, but this idea that they're, you know, you're seeing it on the screen. They, because often the argument um, on capacity fits into the idea that, well, they, they didn't really understand what they were doing. Like, yes, they wanted to prefer one kid, but did they really understand it was going to be X amount um, and, and those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, showing them sort of what, what's going to actually happen, how it's going to break down is important. In my view on a capacity, uh, but not only a capacity, on um, knowledge and approval. Uh, you know, obviously capacity, Look, we're dealing with elderly people um, regularly now. We're going to see those emergency situations, and those are the most stressful. Like, I got to get this done, and I don't even meet the client, and I'm doing it by video, and I'm going to be sending it out to them or in some way watching on video. It's, it's really problematic. But what I would emphasize is, look, uh, perfection is the enemy of good uh, in these days. And if we're going to try to hold ourselves to a standard of perfection or the, you know, what we did in the old days, um, we're never, we're not going to sign any wills. So, um, you know, I think we can do the best we can um, and help these people get wills if they need them, uh, do whatever we can, but we are not going to be able. And, and I don't expect, I hope not, that we're not held to the same standard of care that we would be when we could meet with them um, personally, and so. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, going to be universally uh, accepted as a general proposition. Uh, although I, I hesitate to guess what judges will do. Uh, it is a uh, bloody likely that they're going to give us some uh, some room to move. Um, okay, so so Jordy, can we? Uh, I'm just going to go to some of the uh, questions that have been sent in. Uh, one of them is, could we comment on execution by a client in the case where no witnesses are feasible to attend to have family members who may be beneficiaries sign and relying on section 12 sub three of the uh, succession law reform act with the, um, uh, the plan, um, that the client would come in and resign, uh, if, and when impossible, when, if, and when it is possible. So um, I'm just going to pull up that uh, that section of the Succession Law Reform Act. Um, so th there's a provision, of course, a um, a will that is witnessed by beneficiaries is still valid. Um, the validity of the will is not in question. What is in question is the right of the beneficiaries who are witnesses to also take their gift under the will. Um, and so I'm just going to uh, go to that right here um, and share my screen. Um, so now that requires um, the consent of a whole bunch of people or a court order, uh, uh, a formal sort of trial almost about that, because there's a presumption um, that that device or gift or bequest is void. Uh, I think that's a risky move, riskier than, um, yeah, I guess in a low risk situation, um, I'd prefer to go the uh, incorporation by reference uh, route. Um, you know, is it an option to have beneficiaries witness and know that the will's valid, that they're going to be out? Well, I guess, if, uh, I mean, that's a, I'd really want to cover myself on that one. Um, I'd prefer one of the other strategies, to be honest with you. Um, I think there's a higher likelihood that they'll be accepted. Um, and uh, if we get somebody to, 
who opposes this idea that yes, they were in the room and you know, um, you're gonna have a problem. If it was gonna go on consent anyway, then I would go sort of maybe the other route. Um, but I, I don't know. All right, well, that's great. Um, I've got a question here about just how some of our comments, some general comments on powers of attorney and um, both on the execution and the uh, preparation of. Uh, are you managing that document any differently in the COVID world, uh, both uh, on the preparation and explanation side of it or the execution side? Um, well, so I am, uh, well, first of all, let's just say this. Um, a, a power of attorney, I've just pulled that up, has to be signed in the presence of two witnesses. There is no such thing. Um, at least under the current law, about a holograph power of attorney without, um, without witnesses. Uh, the Act doesn't allow for that specifically. Um, but the Act does have a, a substantial compliance provision there. You can see it in 10 sub 4 that says, um, you know, if it wasn't witnessed properly, um, you can go to court and the court can validate it. Well, that doesn't help much in a situation where um, you're trying to use it and you can't get to court to validate it. So um, I'm sort of using the same theory uh, uh, as far as execution. Yeah, there's not much you can do except get witnesses to it. Um, and, uh, you know, you can rely on this non-compliance. The problem, of course, is from powers of attorney for financial matters, you're going to have to convince the bank's legal department that it's valid. Um, and so that's, that's a real problem. Um, uh, to deal with now, um, hopefully that we'll be able to get these signed by video witnessing. Um, what I've done for our precedents is I've put in uh, signature uh, witnesses um, circles for uh, them to so they they know where to witness where to initial things for the for the client and for the witnesses. Uh, that can add to the ease of the execution of the document. Um, just so everybody, because if you're not there to supervise, it can be difficult. So just being able to direct them to uh, a spot to put their initials and things like that is helpful. Um, you know, it's a real, it's a real problem. It's a real problem. All right. So, sorry, just what you were suggesting about the, uh, hopefully for the witnesses uh, being video as well. Is that part of the proposal yeah. with the, uh, so tell us about that. Uh, I know that that was part of the proposal to the government um, was to allow uh, where it talks about that in the presence of uh, that that be by video. Um, and uh, um, uh, so the, the idea is that you could witness it by video. You're on video. You're watching the, uh, the, the grantor of the power of attorney sign it. Uh, then it's not signed. I mean, who knows what they're going to say, but I, I would not assume it's going to be signed in counterpart. It'll be signed by the grantor uh, and then couriered to one of the witnesses who will get on video with the grantor and sign and then go and get couriered to the next witness. Uh, that ain't a perfect solution, but uh, that's probably better than you, the client signing one copy, you hopefully signing an identical copy as a witness and then the third witness signing it, I don't know how that would work. So um, anyway, we'll see, I, I'm just, we're just speculating right now, but it is part of the proposal that was made to the AG. Right, and just so everyone knows, we're, uh, we're anticipating, but not uh, locking down, but we're gonna have probably an emergency uh, webinar if the legislation comes out on steps and on what we think we should do in a video uh, scenario, because it will be a bit cumbersome and there will be some, practice points that are going to come out of the legislation it'll be just a, a general statement by the legislature presumably that uh, if it if it comes about that video will be allowed and uh, i know you and i have been talking about it and thinking about it and a lot of us on the call have is what does that actually mean mechanically and practice practically and uh, and once the legislation comes out we're going to have a, a webinar right away on that just because uh, we want to look at the legislation and then tweak what we think is going to happen and come out with some concrete steps to uh, walk through a video witness process. All right. Um, so now uh, you, you raised the point about you can't do a holographic power of attorney. 
and I think uh, certainly any of the pushback I've got from uh, in the discussions about any amendments to legislation was that uh, the government sort of looks at that as a, a non-starter in some respects because there is a precedent power of attorney that the public guardian trustee has online and uh, subject to it being able to be printed it's a document that they see I think uh, I'm not speaking for the government but they, I think they see it as a that's the most viable uh, way to do it and because the precedent is so available they I think they think that they weren't as uh, anxious to worry about getting into holograph powers of attorney I will say uh, just as a plug to the Attorney General who's been remarkably uh, nimble on this issue I mean he, he pulled together a group of 25 or 30 lawyers quickly got got input uh, has really got this uh, brief and top of mind uh, and he has also said that once we get through this uh, mess, uh, that he uh, expects that we'll reconvene a group and uh, start to really start to drill down on some issues that haven't been touched. Uh, certainly, I've been doing this 30 years, and there's been no meaningful legislative change in the will side, uh, basically, and uh, the power of attorney side needs uh, updating. And he's uh, anxious to get that going once the dust settles. So I just, I, I do commend him on that. And I'm, I was pleased that he was, he, he volunteered that to us as a group. Um, okay, Jordy, in terms of, I just want to turn now to um, the question of uh, just briefly on what's happening with the courts. And um, I, I can, I can report back. I, we sit on, uh, I sit on a, a subcommittee of the state users uh, group and uh, Justice McEwen has regular calls with us to advise us what's going on uh, a little bit from the court's perspective. And uh, there have been a whole pile of emergency hearings in Toronto anyway. Uh, he's the one who uh, picks whether it meets the threshold. And he says that most people have behaved pretty sensibly and uh, he hasn't rejected many at all. Uh, they've found time to deal with uh, the matters uh, that have fallen into the category of emergency. So that's, uh, that's helpful. I know Justice, uh, Chief Justice Morowitz is going to announce on, I'm told, April 6th or thereabouts, some expansion to the court's access to judges through uh, the court call system. So there's some uh, creeping back into the system uh, of uh, availability for uh, access to justice on matters that maybe aren't quite as urgent. Maybe we'll see. Uh, but uh, it's not clear. Right now, it appears that the criminal courts and the commercial courts and family courts are just uh, out of control, uh, busy with uh, matters, which would make sense. But uh, Justice McEwen is doing his best uh, in Toronto, and I know across the regions, to accommodate the state issues, uh, which are typically driven through elder law uh, issues, uh, elder abuse allegations, and things like that. But we'll see. So that's an update on the courts. Jordy, um, I just want to check now in, in the chat to make sure we've got any other questions that have come in. While you're um, doing that, if I can yep. just jump in about, um, and so what, what we're also seeing is um, mediations, right, that are going, um, uh, are going forward in a, with using video. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, because of Zoom, you can do it and have separate breakout rooms uh, so we're seeing that as well uh, to move things ahead. Um, and uh, it's not ideal, but it's a way of, rather than us uh, waiting for uh, cases that were about to be mediated to, you know, three months or longer, um, you know, we're seeing a bit of that as well. Yeah, and a, and a big group of senior counsel, and not just senior counsel, uh, states counsel have also started uh, a states arbitration uh, platform that we have it on our blog that allows for parties to uh, seek out senior counsel to be arbitrators at a fixed or lower than average <laughs> hourly rate uh, to if the parties will agree they will they can enter into an arbitration agreement and have uh, relatively speaking not uh, highly substantive matters uh, adjudicated and arbitrated in that sense uh, during the COVID period. So if you have a, if you have parties that are prepared to enter into the arbitration agreement, you could uh, res uh, have a quick arbitration on the question of an undertakings or uh, on a question of uh, should we go to video mediation? Uh, should we uh, proceed with discoveries in 30 days or 60 days? If the parties can't agree, these are uh, all tools that um, 
have um, uh, 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 an advantage to moving the lawsuit along. And we have to be realistic that these lawsuits, uh, even with the courts uh, starting to open up a bit, are uh, on the estate side, it's going to be very difficult to um, uh, get these cases moving and our clients are going to be suffering. Uh, it's the estates, as you've got it up on the screen, estates arbitration litigation management, it's EALM. And uh, there's a precedent of the agreement itself. Um, uh, I'm not sure where that is. All right, so we'll, we'll find that and get that up on the, uh, on the webpage. Um, but uh, it allows parties to move along a matter in a consensus type agreement with a, um, a document that uh, is binding on the parties. Uh, so uh, uh, that's where we're at. Now, um, we just, uh, I just got a good point here and I wanted to follow up on is, uh, there is a hearing next week uh, booked to determine whether or not uh, video uh, is um, in the presence of a, by, by way of video is uh, sufficient. There's an article in the Globe and Mail today. I think it's being heard next Tuesday or Wednesday. And um, I know that uh, it may be that the government uh, gets ahead of this uh, with their change. They may not. It may get to a judicial determination. Uh, we're not sure. But uh, thanks so much. I got uh, Brad for putting up that. It was in the Globe today, I think, page three of the business section. So it's a high priority. And uh, I think that'll also. Uh, light a fire under the government in terms of what they're going to uh, consider doing. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, here we are. Um, Jordy, you've got the article right there. I do. Perfect. It's, uh, I just can't get rid of that thing, but uh, yeah. That's fine. So, All right. Uh, and, so, um, and Kavina Negrani is the, um, is the counsel on that. So uh, we'll see how that goes. And uh, um, yeah. So, that's great. Um, all right. So now, uh, Jordy, one of the questions is asked is how can we use the interpreter uh, in the will instructions? Um, and, and, and when we're taking will instructions, if we've got an interpreter, is, is there what would be some of your thoughts and suggestions in that scenario? Well, I'd have them on Zoom as well and um, uh, audio tape. I mean, look. We, we can only do the best we can. I, I don't think that's any different. Um, it would be very similar, I think, uh, to the way we do it live. We'd have the interpreter there. Uh, we'd be, uh, you know, uh, expressing it, the, the interpreter uh, interpreting it and translating it, et cetera. Um, again, I, I can't emphasize enough, but use, use some form of visual I, to make sure that you guys are on the same page. That's, that's, it's even heightened much greater, uh, uh, there's a much greater heightening of the problem of a disconnect between the client saying something or you saying something and the understanding of that. Uh, I think, um, you know, however you want to do it, figure it away because it's, uh, it's way better than trying to do it by phone or something like that. Yeah, and, and back to your point too, that I mean, we're, I, I don't think the standard of care has dropped like a stone, but there may be some flexibility in terms of uh, uh, our expectations. But using an interpreter, even in a live uh, will instruction scenario, uh, you need to be careful. Uh, you need to make sure that the interpreter is certified and that indeed the interpreter is uh, uh, properly uh, uh, exchanging uh, with the witness because uh, you know if you don't know the language, you're not gonna be able to, to test it and you have to rely on the expertise. And so you get the right interpreter and a good, uh, a good dialogue and that they I've always uh, I have lots of meetings with interpreters and I've there's good ways to test whether or not the client's understanding it too so I don't think it changes things dramatically but um, I do emphasize that uh, I don't think that the courts are going to be completely uh, sensitive to us when we go to deal with these issues later but they may give us a little bit of room uh, and that's it um, okay, so just uh, working through the questions, Jordy, did you have anything to follow up on? No, I just, uh, I, again, yeah. Uh, uh, All right. Yeah, nope, nothing. All right, and, and now, Jordan, what is your um, uh, practice in terms of determining the nature and extent of someone's assets uh, when you're taking will instructions? 
some people uh, will take the position that it is a, uh, uh, a comprehensive review. Some people will take it uh, a little bit different uh, in terms of uh, the extent of it. There's a famous case called Captain Estate where Justice uh, the court indicated that uh, the nature and extent of the assets for a very wealthy person wasn't all that important as long as he knew he was wealthy, essentially, is, is part of the, the decision. Um, but Jordy, what is your view? And then before you give me that question answer, I know you've called this up on the screen. We're just getting some questions about the CLE credits. And yes, this is um, uh, properly uh, credited. Uh, both, Jordy and, both, both Jordy and I have uh, CLE accreditation. So. Um, you get one hour of um, uh, substantive uh, for sure. Okay, so Jordy, let's talk about, let, let's ask the, the first deal with the academic question of to, the, to the, what extent is yeah. the nature and extent of the assets uh, required when, when taking will instructions, and then what is your practice? So I, I think it's a contextual decision in the sense that, um, and there are cases that say, look, as long as the client understands uh, generally, they don't have to know their bank account balance to the dollar. For sure, I think that's quite clear. Um, do they have to understand what kind of assets they have? Generally, I think they do. Um, I, you know, it's it, so from an academic point of view. You, you know, again, it's it's in a higher risk situation where you're going to get get called to task if you didn't investigate it. The only thing I would say to you is, if you ask Law Pro, what's the number one claim against lawyers? Uh, a cause of claims against lawyers in the state, it's inadequate investigation. What they didn't ask is the real problem. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to, you know, fine, like, what do you want to do with everything you own? Um, you know, let's do it. Uh, that could open you up. So I do prefer to at least get a set of categories of, of assets and general values, um, because otherwise, the client doesn't really know uh, and, and yes, the argument, of course, is, well, they, they may not have this when they die. It may be completely irrelevant. True enough. The question really is what they know when they make the will. Um, and, and it can emphasize to them the uh, effect and why they should be reviewing their will from time to time when you do use numbers, because it, it, uh, it illustrates um, the importance of keeping their, their wills up to date. Now, if everything is just being divided 100% to one person, well, then it's less relevant on a, on, a, on a question of capacity, whether they knew what they were doing. If instead, though, they're giving certain percentages to certain people and certain assets to certain people, then it's absolutely crucial, in my view, to get a full, fulsome uh, understanding of their assets. If you've got any sort of situation where they're giving specific assets to specific people or specific amounts, then I think it's really quite crucial. So many people don't... Uh put their mind to what their assets are in a sense and, 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 and counter, you know, sort of working through what indeed they have and don't have. They have a general understanding and they kind of think, oh, yeah, I know I've got an RSP, I've got some investment. What sort of tricks and tools do you use to, to, to make sure that you've hit all the categories? Because, you know, for example, it's easy to forget you have a TFSA or something like that, a subcategory within an investment portfolio. Uh, what, what are some of the tools that you use to make sure you don't miss any assets? Well, having the client see it in, in writing uh, visually, even, I always say to them, okay, so here are your assets, just like I'm showing you, here are your assets that, I, that you told me about. Um, you know, is there anything else? And often they'll say, it may be a trigger, right? So I always say, I first of all say, do you own any of the real estate? Do you have, if I don't see a TFSA on there, I'll ask them about a TFSA. Um, fortunately, the software that I use uh, reminds me of things. For example, um, it knows that I've got young kids, so it reminds me, you know, you're sure there's no RESP, um, for example. So things like that, um, that's how I use it. I also use a, a questionnaire going to the client that's pretty comprehensive that asks them just in question form, you know, do you have any, you know, digital assets or pets or things like that? So I'm pretty comfortable that um, I canvas that. But again, you know, as you discuss things, you'll be amazed. Uh, we all are amazed, I'm sure, uh, and have examples of situations where they completely forgot to tell you about a private company that they own. It's like, oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, but again, seeing it rather than just verbalizing it is important. 
So, but, but don't you have a sort of a checklist as well as you go through it with the client on the asset side? Yeah. So there's a checklist that's built in and then, um, and then, you know, uh, it's a matter of discussion and reminders that pop up. Great. So um, one of the questions just bouncing around a little bit here and trying to get to as many as we can. Um, this witness is a beneficiary issue, this legal issue that we, you talked about. Um, one of the suggestions was uh, that might be a good, would it be a good idea to give the witness a nominal gift so there's no practical consequence for the gift being voided, but would, the, but would this still comply with the formalities of execution? What, what do you think about that, Jordy? Uh, I don't understand it, to be honest with you. Um, you give the witness a gift, even though they weren't going to be getting a gift? Yeah, to, to, uh, that does, does, that, that, does that change the, the scenario for you at all, is all I'm asking, they're asking? No, it, you wouldn't do that. It makes To me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. Um, if they're not a beneficiary to start with, then they're a proper witness. If they are a beneficiary to start with, then you don't have to give them a nominal gift. Uh, so I, I, I think that that... Um, Probably not. I'm not sure I understand. You don't think it's worth doing. Okay, no. good. Um, now, um, just coming back to the uh, uh, one of the, the, you were talking about law pros concerns and, and understanding the nature and extent of the information you're receiving. One area where I see uh, problems arising on the litigation side is the uh, those, uh, you know, the standing of the parties later. And, and so I'm often uh, pushing my clients on the intake side to give me a full tree with uh, more detail than sometimes they understand. And I'll have to explain to them um, because I do find that if you don't have, for example, dates of birth, or you've got a second cousin that you've been sending a package to every two weeks in, uh, in Europe, um, identified in the will process, um, do you, how important is it to you to make sure that you've got all of the members of the family uh, uh, located? Well, I, I think it's really important, um, especially if you're treating people differently. Um, so knowing that, you know, I'm, oh, I'm going to give, uh, it, you know, to my brother. And if you don't canvas, well, do you have any other siblings? Oh, yeah, I do. I have a stepbrother and a, you know, and a half brother and others. I mean, I think that opens you up to, um, you know, again, that's the claim for inadequate investigation. And so I try to build out as full of family tree as I can. Um, and uh, things like residency, um, you know, uh, if you're trying to, you know, or, or citizenship is so relevant in, in the state planning. Um, and so canvassing those things, and they can be done just quickly with a, you know, if you have any, or any of these people, a U.S. citizen. Um, and, you know, you can just, you know, just fill that in because it may be relevant to, you know, yeah, they're a Canadian citizen and they're a U.S. citizen. Well, as we know, the U.S. doesn't understand dual citizenship. They only, if you're a U.S. citizen, whether you're a citizen of any other country, you're a U.S. citizen. So things like that are important to keep on your radar um, and to provide, you know, at least a, if, if you're not going to provide advice on that, which I don't because I'm a, I'm not a foreign lawyer, um, then at least a waiver of that kind of information. But things like that are important disability, special circumstances, um, for example. So sorry, you know, sorry, these are yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Tell us about the special circumstances. Yeah. So the, we just, you know, I use a checklist to make sure that there are no special circumstances related to a family member or beneficiary. Like, are they estranged? Do they have a disability? Are there relationship difficulties with some other person? Do they have problems managing their finances? Do they reside with the client? Um, do they receive support from the client? These are all things that, um, you know, should be on our checklist just to make sure that, you know, and you don't have to ask that for each person, but you can just say, are there any, anybody in here who's estranged? You know, um, or tell me about the relationship. As you, as, you, as you start getting into the planning and they start saying, well, I'm going to prefer this person or that person or put these two people together as executors, that's when you need to ask about those special circumstances. And what's about direct relationships? That just identifies uh, the relationship between two people uh, in our, in this. So if you uh, go here, just list all the people in there are related and how they're related. Right. 
and, and the nature of the relationship, the second cousin, first cousin, right. married spouse, and all that. Okay. Right. Um, I, now, now, what what do you do though when you get into situations of uh, uh, second marriages? Uh, you just put up the perfect uh, family tree, the family tree, from yeah, the modern, modern family. Uh, I love right. this. Uh, your illustration tree is perfect because this is the uh, this is a will planner's uh, uh, law school question in terms of how you do this estate plan. But um, the uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as we've always been careful about uh, acting for uh, spouses when they have kids from a different relationship, um, identifying. I, I remember one meeting where I was in a meeting for, I must have had three meetings with them. And so it finally dawned on me, and, and I'm not obviously very good because it finally dawned on me that one of the kids was not the, a, a child of the, one of the parents. Um, and, you know, so it, and they just kept talking about how they're their kids, the kids, the kids. You know, how many kids do you have? I have three kids, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I didn't ask for, for you know, a DNA sample. Turns out that one of the kids was actually not the kid. They just always treat them as a kid. So it's important to drill down on that. Fortunately, I caught that before we had two, after two meetings. But not, not my shining moments. <laughs> well, that's, that's important. Uh, now, in terms of appointments, uh, your, your, the rationale in terms of how you go through that uh, from a logistic standpoint, uh, we'll, you know, how often are you putting forward trust companies? How often are you suggesting two to five? Like how many executors are you you're typically uh, uh, suggesting? What, what are some of your practices in that regard? Yeah, so I typically say one to three. Um, and every one of those has an issue with them, like we all know. Uh, Every, for every solution we have, there's another problem. But, um, you know, I, I do believe that most estate disputes, um, not necessarily litigation, but most estate disputes, fights or bad feelings or whatever, come, come down to the appointment of the executor. Um, even if it's not going to be a full-blown challenge, it's going to potentially lead to problems, either friction among co-executors or bad feelings for people who were excluded or uh, people who are doing it feel the burden of it uh, and uh, ungrateful uh, that the beneficiaries are ungrateful. So it's a real, real difficult one. It's, I think it's underappreciated by our clients about <clears throat> that, that decision. Um, and I do, you know, I, I do believe that most of those bad feelings could, uh, could be avoided if you went with a completely independent uh, executor, there's nothing to rally the people who don't get along uh, like a common enemy, and that's what that independent executor might be. But that, that being said, it's not obviously for every situation. It's uh, if everybody gets along, and um, uh, you know, it's it's great. But I think I think clients is something that we as as advisors should emphasize to our clients the real emotional uh, impact of whatever decision they make on that. Thing. So the final question before we wrap up on our first hour and our second uh, some webinar hour, uh, powers of attorney, uh, do you, uh, how do you approach those? Joint and several, several, uh, joint, what, what's, your, what's your practice? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, again, for every solution, we got a problem. Uh, joint, you know, is the idea that they both have to act together. Joint and several means either or, uh, or together. Um, so joint works great as long as they're both sort of on side and get along and are in relative close proximity. It works better uh, from a logistics point of view. It's got a downside in the sense that they both have to do everything together. Joint and several is better from a logistics point of view, but um, it does give rise to the possibility that one might do, go out and do one thing and the other countermands it. Um, so if they don't get along, that's not the greatest solution. It works better if one's, if they get along, but one's just not available as much as the other. Um, so uh, there's no perfect answer to that. I just try to lay that out as best I can to the client and let them decide. Uh, some practitioners say, I forget joint and several. I'm only going with joint because it's, you know, it's, it, it, they got, they have to get along. I mean, uh, you know, this idea that they can each countermand each other. Yes, yeah, that would be a disaster, of course. Um, I think the joint several is more for a logistical point of view, but it has its own problems. 
Okay, great. Well, look, we're going to be back next Friday, same time, and uh, with with new developments. Now, we may have, as I say, a special webinar opportunity if the legislation comes out before next Friday. We intend to uh, go live and uh, deal with that because uh, it will be a bit of a ground shaker in terms of the practice, and we'd like to have uh, some good discussions about that. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us today, and I hope this platform was a little better than last week's. So we got through the full hour without too many technical glitches, and everyone's cooperation on the video and on the mute was perfect because the stream worked. So good <laughs> luck and uh, be safe. Thanks, Jordy. Thank you. Take care, everyone.